Okay, welcome to this video on media representations of social class. Uh, it's for A level sociology, paper two. It's on the section of the media. I'm the sociology guy. You can follow me at the sociology guy on Twitter. You can also follow me on Instagram at the sociology guy. And you can also go to my website, which is the sociologyguy.com, which is where so, like, I keep a lot of the resources that I produce. So things like uh, mind maps, knowledge organizers, exam tips, checklists, model answers. It is still in, in construction. Um, so there's lots more being updated all the time. Okay, quick disclaimer on this video. I've got no prior knowledge of the A-level exams. I don't write any of the questions for AQA. Um, I've written the question myself and the item has been created by me. It's not by AQA. Um, it's based on question types that have not appeared on any of the specimen papers or on the AS or A-level exams up until June 2019. And the essay structure is just one way of answering the question. Um, other approaches may still score full marks. So here's the question. Um, it's a possible question that could come up on paper two on the media section, section B3. Um, they've asked already about gender differences. They've asked about ethnic differences as a 10 mark question. They've not asked anything about social class differences. So I thought this would be one to have a look at, um, even though it's the night before the exam. Um, sociologists would suggest that often the media falls into focus it fails to focus upon the social class inequalities in society and devotes most of its coverage to the dominant uh, social classes in society. Other sociologists suggest that the ownership of the media deliberately portrays some groups as deviant in order to stop people having sympathy for their cause. However, recent changes in the ownership and production of media have led some to challenge these views and media is beginning to represent a broader selection of social class backgrounds. So that's the item. And the question is, applying material from item B and elsewhere, evaluate sociological explanations for the differences in representations of social class groups by the media. Okay, I'm going to pick out a few kind of things from the item. Here, media fails to focus upon social class inequalities. This is the idea that the media doesn't really cover poverty. Um, when it talks about poverty, it will talk about percentages, it will talk about figures, it doesn't really give the human story behind poverty. We very rarely see them interview people um, who are homeless, we very rarely see them interview people who've lost their homes, we very rarely see them interview children who are going hungry um, during the holidays because their parents can't afford to feed them um, when they would normally get free school meals. And it devotes most of its coverage to the dominant social classes in society. Okay, so this kind of hints at things like the ideological state apparatus, the ownership of the media by elites. Other sociologists suggest that the ownership of the media deliberately portrays some groups as deviant in order to stop people having sympathy for their cause. Okay, little kind of hint at things like moral panics, um, being able to divide and conquer um, society, um, being able to sort of divide the middle classes from the working classes to stop them overthrowing um, the, the ruling classes. All of these are kind of Marxist ideas. So a bit of a hint here, you need to talk about Marxism within this question. And then the second paragraph, as it usually is, um, shows you that, OK, there is another version of events and that we need to actually look at uh, things in a bit of a broader context, maybe bring some evaluation in. However, recent changes in the ownership and production of media have led some to challenge these views. Changes in ownership and production of media, so changes in ownership, um, growth of new media, production of media, content creators, people who will create their own videos, who will create their own blogs, which has led to a bit of a left-wing movement, also led to an alt-right movement as well. Um, but what it's done is it's changed the way in which we um, view the media. The media is beginning to represent a broader selection of social class backgrounds. So as a consequence of the new media, what we're starting to see is we're starting to see more accurate representations of the lower classes. We're starting to see more criticism of the upper classes and the elites. This is a worksheet um, I've done kind of that is up on my website and I've tweeted it out and put it on Instagram as well that just looks at the ways in which the media represents five different social groups and um, very favorably about the monarchy uh, you can look at the research that's done by Nairn that suggests modern mass media supports the monarchy because they reinforce British values they reinforce the values of uh, the family and as a consequence, we tend to be obsessed with the royal family and um, looking at sort of like what Kate Middleton's wearing, what Bergen Markle's wearing. Uh, and that's nothing new. It was the same with Princess Diana. Um, we've always focused on these kind of trivialities of, of the monarchy without really challenging what their purpose is. 
The upper class is an elite, very much Marxist critique here from Newman, who suggests that there is very much positive focus on, on the elites, mainly because they own the media, um, mainly because of capitalism and because the elites have money and we all aspire to have money, allegedly. Um, we could argue against this from a postmodern viewpoint. Do, does everybody really believe in this idea of capitalism and does everybody really crave economic success or do they actually crave um, kind of uh, social, um, social well-being? The middle classes, um, they tend to be portrayed as the norm, mainly because most of the people who work in the media are middle class or have middle class values. Um, so what we tend to see is actors represented, um, uh, actors will represent middle class values, uh, journalists um, will represent middle class values. The interests that we see in the media are very, very middle class. This leads to some moral panics, particularly when the working class um, will have almost a subcultural view of something in society. So, for example, rave culture. Um, it was very big within the working class culture, but the middle class didn't understand it. So what they do is they create a moral panic about it. And this is um, and because the middle class control or because the middle class are um, controlling the media in, in the way that the sort of they produce most of the media, they get away with that. Uh, the working class, um, again, Newman, very Marxist, um, suggest positive representations of the working class are very, very few and far between. If we think about some of the representations of the working class, it tends to be in things like soap operas, Coronation Street, EastEnders. Um, you can also sort of like things like Jeremy Kyle, Benefit Street. There is a general negative view of the working class. If you look at high-end dramas and particularly dramas that critics see as good, there's very few uh, working class people in those. Jones also sees the coverage of the working class as an assault by middle classes, what, we, what he calls liberal bigotry. Uh, assuming that the working class are racist, homophobic and sexist. We've seen a lot of this at the moment with um, Brexit. Uh, and what we will see is that particularly the, very much the Remain side is, is, is very much this kind of middle class liberals um, who are attacking people from the working class uh, and suggesting that they voted Brexit, not because they've been ignored by um, the politicians, but because they are um, racist, uh, they are homophobic, they're sexist. Uh, Corinne and Seaton say the media aimed at working class ignores important issues. This is why newspapers like The Sun and The Star tend to focus on celebrity news rather than actual news. Um, and pluralists argue that this idea with the working class is the working class get what they want. So the working class will purchase these papers and they will uh, access media that is seen as being popular culture and therefore the media um, reacts to that and gives them more of it. And McKendrick looked at poverty, as did Cohen, and they both suggest that poverty is minimal. Cohen thinks that um, the idea of poverty, there is this narrative paid out, played out by uh, the media that those who are at the very bottom of the economic system are to blame for most of society's problems. Uh, they're portrayed as scroungers, they're portrayed as chavs. Um, Owen Jones wrote a book about Charles, the demonization of the working class is one. Uh, Lawler would back this up by saying that the media deliberately uses labels like chaff to describe poverty to avoid people feeling sorry for them. Um, as well as only being represented in statistics. We don't talk about their lifestyle, we don't talk about the things that have an impact on them. What we do is we focus on sort of like the fact um, that um, you know there is a certain percentage of people below the poverty line in the UK. So let's look at the introduction here. Um, again, introductions aren't always necessary. You can just dive straight in. I like to do an introduction just because it kind of sets the scene. And my introduction here just gives an overview of some of the things I'll talk about. The media is predominantly owned by the work, the ruling classes in the UK and staffed mostly by the middle classes. Marxists would suggest that this leads to a very different representations of the different social classes in society. For example, the monarchy, given their status in society, often reports in a very positive manner, whilst the wealth of the elites in society means they, they too are portrayed positively. On the other hand, the working classes, as they have little power in the media, are often portrayed negatively, while poverty is barely mentioned as it conflicts with the ideology of economic success in Britain. Very much an overview, I'm not going to get too many marks for that. All I've done is I've said to the examiner who's reading this is that, you know, I know about the differences um, in the way the different social groups are uh, represented. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the essay. For those of you who are new to uh, my videos, um, I I set my the structure of my essays out by applying the first line, explaining the next line, then doing a little bit of analysis. How does the idea work? Um, 
Can I give any contemporary examples? And then I would evaluate it by criticizing or finding some support for it through um, sociological research evidence. So, paragraph one. Uh, one explanation for social class betrayals in the media is offered by Marxists. Uh, they suggest that the ownership of media by the elites in society gives them the power to represent themselves positively and to shape the media in their own interests. What I've done here is I've applied a bit of my knowledge of sociology and what I've done is I've explained to show that I understand um, what, what Marxists say. What I need to do next is my analysis, which is showing a deeper understanding. And I've done this by throwing in a bit of theory. Uh, Newman suggests that the elites portray themselves in capitalism in a positive light so that they might reinforce the position at the top of the social hierarchy. The media's focus on consumption of luxury goods means that the elites are best placed to be seen as successful in the eyes of capitalism. This is reinforced further by the focus on the economy rather than social conditions of silent progress in society. So often we will watch the news and we will see right economic growth has hit 3%. Not happened for a long time, but we will see that and we will think that society is fixed. Society is wonderful. Society is fantastic because the rich are getting richer. What we don't see is when the news is reporting uh, the growth of inequality and the news is not reporting um, how social conditions are, are, are changing massively for people at the lower end of society. What they're doing is, is they're putting a positive spin on society by saying, right, the rich are getting richer. Evaluation of this, however, recent changes in the way that media is produced has challenged this position. The growth of new media, particularly in the aftermath of the global credit crisis, has challenged the idea that those who are rich and successful are at the top of society. Increasingly, there has been a growth in content creation, particularly amongst those looking to challenge the power of the elites in society. And this has led to many high, pro high profile elites such as Boris Johnson and Theresa May coming under increasing criticism from sections of the media. Similarly, criticisms of American President Donald Trump shows the contempt with which some of the new media hold the elites. What we're seeing now in our society with a lot of this criticism of um, government and politicians is relatively new. Um, I grew up in the 1980s and so I created a television program called Spirit and Image, which was a satire on politicians. What we're seeing now is we're seeing a lot more criticism of existing politicians and it is changing the way in which um, we are represented. And just this week, it said that the Brexit party um, tops some of the polls. And that is seen as being a reaction to um, you know these very, very traditional views that politicians are elites. Um, Nigel Farage, despite the fact that sort of like he is part of the elite, he does have friends in the media, he was an investment banker, um, is seen as a man of the people and therefore people will, will then look to follow him. Not true, but by the way, um, he's going to basically sell the NHS out from underneath you. Sorry if you're a Nigel Farage supporter, but if you are, why are you studying sociology? Um, and likewise, things like Donald Trump. Donald Trump, I've never known in my lifetime such criticism for um, an American president. And I lived through sort of like George Bush, both of them. Um, massive criticism of him and massive contempt um, of him um, by the media. So, paragraph two, one social class that has generally been well received by the media is the royal family. Nairn suggests that this is due to the fact that the royal family are seen to represent traditional values. Um, it's argued in the post-war era, the royal family underwent a reinvention to appeal to the masses. Uh, this led to a focus on the normal family life of the monarchy and interest in the trivial and everyday features of the monarchy. Increasing media coverage of what Kate Middleton or Meghan Markle have worn um, to discuss uh, to discussion of what the family, no, royal family watch on television is designed to reinforce the position of the monarchy as, as being a normal family rather than the extreme representation of elites in society. We've normalised the royal family. There was a period of time, probably in the 1980s, when Princess Diana kind of broke down these barriers between the elites and the working class. She became the people's princess, uh, to, to coin a term. And the monarchy, particularly when Diet Charles and Diana broke up, um, was under attack a little bit because she was seen as being the darling of the masses and therefore um, the monarchy was seen as being kind of the evil empire, if you like. That changed um, when um, the film The Queen came out, which was a representation of the Queen's normal life. A fantastic PR stunt. Helen Mirren did a great job. Um, but what it does is it um, reinforces this idea that the royal family are just like all of us, that they're normal, they're a normal family, and even though they are the elite, um, they do normal things. However, critics would suggest that there's an ulterior motive to this coverage and that media's focus on the royal family as part of an ideological state apparatus to reinforce ideas of social solidarity in society. 
things like royal weddings. Usually there's a royal wedding as soon as we have a conservative government, 1981, um, 2011, and also to act as a moral compass for other families to adhere to. As such, royal scandals, such as the divorce of Princess Charles and Princess Diana, have a divisive effect on the moral fabric of the country and create some moral ambiguity. Um, there was a lot uh, and even to this day, there's lots of people sort of like who think that um, should Prince Charles ascend to be king, that Camilla should never get the title of queen because she was divorced and because she broke up their marriage, um, which is a very, very traditional view. We wouldn't see that anywhere else, I don't think, in society. But within the elites, it reinforces this idea that marriage is for life, that family is most is the most important institution. Paragraph three, a third social group that represented the media of the middle class. Um, this group is generally represented as the norm in society, particularly because of their dominance in media production and partly because of their purchasing power for advertisers. If we think about adverts that we see on the television, particularly for cars, it's always a middle class family. It's always a middle class male. It's always a middle class female. Um, they have a more disposable income, so therefore they are the ones that we target. Most media outlets concentrate on the views of the middle class as being a norm and focus on their traditionally conservative nature. Uh, they're overrepresented in dramas and as experts on news programmes. The betrayal of the middle class in the media often focuses upon moral decency, which reaffirms the norms and values of society, and often acts as, as and, and they often act as moral entrepreneurs when faced with moral panics. Church leaders, teachers, doctors, educationalists all suggest reasons for moral panics, uh, particularly when the folk devil is working class or from a minority, and the media treats them as experts on the topic. Recently, there's been a lot of coverage about um, knife crime in London, and they always tend to trot out the same kind of experts, all white, all middle class, all professors. There's a few instances where we've seen sort of like African Car people of African Caribbean backgrounds. Very rarely do we actually see working class Ar African Caribbean backgrounds discussing the problems that are creating this moral panic of knife crime. It's always the middle class who tend to be the experts. Lots of people looking down and saying, this is why people do it. Um, and that's because these people are associated with the media. These people have friends in the media and therefore they're portrayed as experts. However, changes to the media, particularly with the birth of reality television and increased digitalization and interactivity have led to a diminishing influence of the middle classes in popular culture. Programs such as Geordie Shore and one of my favorites, Love Island, have created moral panics about behavior that have largely been ignored by the working class as the status of the middle class has, dim has diminished and is seen as outdated. In response, there's been a growth of liberal bigotry, according to Jones, as the middle class label the working classes as boorish, sexist, and racist. We see this a lot. Um, I could be accused of liberal bigotry, so because even though I sort of, like I say that Love Island is one of my favorites, it's not, I'm being incredibly sarcastic. And the way I criticize it, I could be uh, ignored, uh, I could be accused of being um, a liberal bigot, even though I think Love Island is completely mindless entertainment. Um, but this is what is happening, is the middle class will label anything the working class see as good as being boorish or sexist or racist um, because it challenges their moral values. Okay, So the growth of these programs shows the diminishing influence of middle class values on wider society. Paragraph four, the most disadvantaged group in media representations, according to sociologists, is the working class and underclass. Uh, working classes and the underclass are rarely represented positively in the media, as some critics suggesting that this is a deliberate ploy in order to divide society in order for the elites to remain in power. We've seen a little bit of this with crime before when we talked about the myth of black criminality and the black mugger. Um, what we do is we create a scapegoat in society to blame all of the problems on. Curran and Seaton suggest that media produced for the working classes often assumes lower levels of intelligence and a fascination with the trivial, things like celebrity culture. Furthermore, McKendrick suggests that those suffering from poverty are rarely represented at all, often being replaced with statistics rather than actual human stories. I mentioned that a little bit earlier on in this video. Further support for the disadvantaged position of the lower classes comes from Lawler, who suggests that the media often deliberately label the lower class as chavs and perpetuate the myth that poverty is a characteristic rather than a circumstance in order to divert any sympathy away from the plight of the poor and instead spread the narrative of laziness, inadequate socialisation and immoral behaviour. This is the idea that you get some people through the media, through watching the media, who will say, oh right, they can't be that poor if they're having cigarettes and tattoos. 
nonsense. I mean, we are assuming through the media and the way the media portray poor people that being poor is a choice, that people choose that. Um, poverty is a circumstance that comes about because of lots of different factors um, under, and under educational underachievement, poor housing and um, structural issues. Um, the, you know, the fact that if you're working class, you're more likely to remain working class because of the attitudes that have been passed down to you. However, the, despite the rise of things like poverty porn, and um, this is things like Jeremy Kyle, Benefit Street, the growth of new media has looked to tackle some of the causes of poverty rather than simply blame those who are victims of it. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the conclusion. Um, in your conclusion, um, a 20 marker, you're looking for four well-developed paragraphs with evaluation and then a conclusion. And this is where I say be a smart ass. This is where you get the opportunity to really wow the examiner and say, look, this is my knowledge of sociology. I can apply it to contemporary society. I can bring in some contemporary stuff and say, look, this is what I think is the case. In conclusion, sociological explanations for the representations of different social classes in the media often reflect the reasons for social hierarchies in the first place. Whilst the power of the media is concentrated in the hands of the elites and produced by the middle classes, there will always be an imbalance in the representation of the lower classes in society. What I'm basically saying here is, is while the rich are rich and they control all the most powerful institutions, we will always have inequality. However, the growth of new media and content creators offers hope to the lower classes that a new generation of media producers will be able to accurately and fairly reflect the lives of those in the lower social classes. I'm going to pause there a second because we've seen people like Professor Green go around and talk about um, working class boys and their, and their lack of aspirations. We've seen people like Stacey Dooley do documentaries. This is because of digitalization, because these aren't on what we would see as being... Um, mainstream media they tend to be put away on bbc um, bbc3 online but people can still access them uh, whilst holding to account the rich and powerful in society an example of this is in the aftermath of disasters like the grenfell tower there's been an increasing focus on the corruption of the elite and stories of the victims which offers hope for a more just society <clears throat> grenfell is a really useful example to use not only in the media but also in crime, particularly state crime, um, because what you have is you have this massive focus on this huge humanitarian disaster, which ultimately is down to the fact that people wanted to save a little bit of money and weren't listening to the residents. You have lots of people who were at the lowest, uh, who were part of the lowest socioeconomic status who died because rich people wanted to, uh, to save themselves some money. Um, and we see that being reported more often now. We know that out of the 90 million pounds that was raised for, raised for Grenfell, only 2 million has been distributed so far. We can look at Grenfell Tower and we can say this is a horrendous thing that has happened in our society. And we see the images of the firemen working on it. We see, um, you know, the lack of empathy from Theresa May, you know, when she goes to, to visit. So we see now a lot more clearly because there is more media around because there's more new media okay that would be my conclusion okay. uh, some of the other videos i've done for this uh, marxism and family feminism and family both for paper two uh, obviously i've done all the education papers I've also last year I did Marxism and crime, ethnicity and crime, globalization and crime as a series of videos because I think that they have got um, a potential to sort of like get students a little bit worried and have not really shown up on any of the papers yet. I also did a 40 day challenge with the 10 mark questions on. I did 40 um, 10 mark questions in 40 days leading up to the first paper. You can go onto my website, thesociologyguy.com and download those. Thank you very much for watching um, and I hope you do really well on your exams. Goodbye.